afternoon, and once again, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you again, members and guests, for joining us today for our uh, uh, much-anticipated event with uh, our uh, guest of honour. And now I'd like to ask you to please join me in welcoming our television and webcast viewers as well. And my name is Danny Asaf, and have the pleasure of serving as the President of the Canadian Club of Toronto for this 2015-2016 season, and thank you again for joining us. Again, in our 119-year history, we're always proud and honoured to host leading guests, leading experts, prominent Canadians, and people that can tell us and advise us and inform us on things that are important to us and impact our lives. In addition, we're proud through our programs and our activities, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, media and social opportunities, we offer you access to these dynamic business and political leaders. And before I formally introduce our guest speaker, I would appreciate if you gave me an indulgence to tell you a little bit about our upcoming, some of our key upcoming events. On January 20th, the club will be presenting two events. The first, a breakfast meeting, will feature the Honorable John McCallum, Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, in a fire chat, fireside chat with Ratna Ahmedvar, Executive Director of Ryerson's Global Diversity Exchange and Lifeline Syria Chair. Also on January 20th, this coming Wednesday, we are hosting a lunch event that brings retired Army General Stanley McChrystal to our podium and also the author of the new book, Team of Teams, to talk about what the Army can teach us about modern business leadership. You can order your tickets and review the club's list of upcoming events at canadianclub.org. And you can also join us and join the conversation via Twitter at CDN C-L-U-B-T-O, or by simply using that hashtag. I would also like to take an opportunity to express our thanks and gratitude for our event sponsor, the TD Bank Group, represented here by Colleen Johnson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colleen and TD, for your generous support of today's luncheon. And now on to the main event, of course. Thirteen years after its formation, ten of which saw it govern our great nation through some very interesting and challenging times, the Conservative Party of Canada is now pressing the reset button for this next generation. This leadership race will be held as the party settles into its role as the official opposition under the direction of its new interim leader. The Honourable Rana Ambrose, while new to the role, is clearly uh, to those who know her and those who are aware of her, is no stranger to leadership in this country. Ms. Ambrose is a federal cabinet veteran, having held more than nine ministerial roles since she first went to parliament only 12 years ago. Nine positions in 12 years. And in 2006, she became the youngest woman in Canadian history to hold a cabinet position when she was appointed the Minister of Environment. Truly an example to all of us, to my sons and especially my daughters, of what the future holds for all of them in modern Canada. She was instrumental in introducing the Clean Air Act and led the call for new inter the, a new international environment agreement. Other cabinet roles have included Minister of Labour, Minister of Public Works and Government Services, and Minister of the Status of Women. In that role, she read she led the call for an International Day of the Girl at the United Nations to help raise awareness of the discrimination faced by girls. As Minister of Health, she oversaw the passage of Vanessa's Law. The law signaled a major change for patient safety in Canada. The interim Conservative Party leader was first elected as a Member of Parliament for Edmonton Spruce Grove in 2004. And as an Edmontonian, that makes me especially proud to see you as the interim leader of this great party. Her community service has included working with organizations to end violence against women, including the Status of Women Action Group, the Victoria Sexual Assault and Sexual Abuse Crisis Center, and the Edmonton Women's Shelter. Ms. Ambrose, the Honorable Ms. Am Rana Ambrose, welcome to the Canadian Club of Toronto. Our podium is now your podium.
Welcome. Thank you, Danny. Danny and I are both from Edmonton, so we've been commiserating about the Oilers. It's great to be here. I just had a chance to do a little bit of hellos to people in the crowd, and there are so many friends in the crowd that I haven't seen for a while. Where's Senator Khan? Stand up. This is one of our senators. This is what happens when you retire from the Senate. You stop shaving. He said he hasn't shaved since he left the Senate. But there are so many current colleagues and former colleagues that are here with me today. There's provincial colleagues, municipal colleagues. Thank you so much for being here. And what a kind introduction. It's great to be kicking off a My National Tour here in Toronto. I always have to watch, because I'm a Western Canadian, how much love I show Toronto <laughs> when I'm here. But Toronto is a fantastic city, and I love coming here. I have a lot of friends here. And it is a great city, and I'm really looking forward to hitting the road to talk to Canadians of all walks of life, not just here in Toronto, but I'll be in Winnipeg and Vancouver and then in Calgary. My colleagues, Lisa Raitt, Lisa's with us today, and Phil McCollman are going to join me on the road to do some pre-budget consultations, and we'll be doing one later here today in the GTA. I'm so pleased to be here, particularly at the Canadian Club. I know you have a great history. And today, I hope to outline the Conservative Party of Canada's approach to the upcoming session of Parliament. So thank you very much for the invitation. Let me just say at the outset that it is such an incredible honour to serve as the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, and of course as interim leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. I am a very proud Conservative, and I'm very proud of our Conservative movement, our Conservative history, and our Conservative legacy. I'm proud that we have four Conservative Prime Ministers that I've been able to talk to and get advice from, one being your dad. I was just telling Caroline about all the great advice he's given me in the last few months, and even years before that. But what a great opportunity as we rebuild and start to look towards our future, to have this kind of knowledge and experience as an interim leader. And you know, John Diefenbaker, who is one of our legacy Prime Ministers, said that this party has a sacred trust. And for the last 150 years, we have upheld this trust as the party that has represented Canadians, their dreams and their aspirations. Our party is the party of confederation. We are the party of the first female cabinet minister. And I'm very proud of that. We're also the party of the first Aboriginal senator. And of course, the party of the Bill of Rights, much before the Charter of Rights. And the party of the first female prime minister. That makes me very proud. Maybe the next Prime Minister will be a Conservative woman. Where's Lisa? Where's Caroline? Where's Caroline? Who else is in the room? Barbara McDougall's here with us. Barbara? I know you're still active in politics. Come on. But in this great tradition, we as Conservatives will move forward as a strong opposition that holds this government to account as we continue to ensure that Canadians' interests, dreams, and aspirations are represented and that Canada remains the envy of the world. And not just that we're hip. Have you heard we're hip? We're hip. We want to be hip, but we don't want to be broke. <laughs> hip is good. Hip is very good, but prosperous is good too. But this is a country that is founded on law, freedom, and democracy. Our country is built on equality of opportunity. And our party represents a handout. It represents a hand up, not a handout. And these are the values that are inseparable from the values of our party. So as opposition, ours is an important role with a long and proud tradition in our parliamentary system. And we are going to do that job with vigor, with energy, and with honor. And now we're facing quite challenging times. I don't have to tell those of you in this room. These are very interesting times in Canadian politics, but also anxious times for our security and uncertain times for our economy. And the challenges are big. Whether it's the rise of ISIS and terror around the world, or the sudden and rapid decline of the price of commodities, global stock markets, and the value of our Canadian dollar. The challenges are real, and they require government to take responsible action to keep us safe and keep our economy growing. And we have a very new and untested group in Ottawa. That challenge will be real for them. 
especially when the policies they espouse are clearly bad for the economic prosperity of our country. Now, where do I begin? I could go on a rant, but I'll just say a few things. First of all, the promise to keep deficits to just $10 billion. That was blown within two weeks. Blown within 30 days was the surplus. So will it be 40 billion, 30 billion, 20 billion? We don't know. And it wasn't because of a downturn in the economy that the surplus was blown. It was because they spent $3 billion in new spending before the year actually ran out. Taxing the 1%, it sounded great during the election to pay for a tax cut for the middle class. It's not really a cut when you're just moving money around and redistributing other people's wealth. But to what end? When I was door knocking during the election, I met a couple. She was a nurse and he was a pipe fitter. And they said they were really surprised to find out they're part of the 1%. And I think a lot of people were surprised. But now we know that the math wasn't done right, the analysis wasn't done properly, and we find that now we owe $1.4 billion. So the tax cut wasn't really a cut. The threat of a carbon tax that is hitting an already crippled energy sector. I can tell you, I'm from Alberta, we already have a carbon tax. Taking stock options or taxing stock options to, for startups. In Vancouver, the tech sector is reeling about this because they use stock options to attract good talent. So they say they're already seeing the brain drain. And piling on more costs to small businesses through increased payroll taxes like CPP and EI. But you know what? Despite all of that, these are not policies we agree with, despite all of that, we as conservatives still believe that Canada remains an incredible place to live, work, and raise a family. And while politicians have different philosophies, the Liberals believe that you can spend your way to prosperity, and Conservatives believe in smaller government and prevailing market forces, I truly believe that in our Parliament, we are all united in all parties in our shared desire to keep Canada the best place in the world to live. So throughout this upcoming parliamentary session, you can count on us as the Conservative Party of Canada to be the voice of taxpayers the voice of everyday working people and their families. These are the same Canadians who all too often don't actually have a say in Ottawa, but they do get stuck with the bill in the end. On October 19th, almost six million Canadians cast a ballot for Canada's Conservatives. They voted for lower taxes, a balanced budget, and a tough stand against those who want to do us harm in the world. So we will stand up and demand that the government make its case for every tax dollar it spends. We will demand that it justify each and every intervention, or as many Canadians see it, interference with Canadians' lives or Canadian businesses. Every time it levies a tax, every time it imposes a regulation, every time it limits a freedom of any kind, the government must make the case that its actions are in the best interests of all Canadians, that they're promoting security, or creating opportunity without limiting our right to choose what's best for us and our loved ones. Now, I said that we will support the government when appropriate, and we will, because we all want good government. It's one of the founding principles of our country. But I have to tell you, in the first few weeks, the Liberals have made it really difficult for us. <laughs> and we're already seeing some troubling signs. We need a plan. We really need a plan on the economy. A budget apparently is still months away. It could be the end of March. And it's really important right now in our economy that we do have a plan, that we have some strong signals from the government. If you recall the economic crisis of 2008, our, we put our budget out. It was a very unique time, but we are back in a unique time by January 27th because the markets, Canadians needed that signal. So I'm asking Prime Minister Harper to meet because I want to offer him my support to work with the government at the earliest opportunity to discuss what is the rapidly deteriorating economic situation in Canada. And it is rapidly deteriorating. Of course, we have significant policy differences with the Liberal government on economic issues, but that doesn't mean that we can't work together to try and find some common ground. First of all, we need the Liberal government to put a meaningful limit on the amount of additional debt that they will burden Canadian taxpayers with. We need them to follow up 
on the work that's already been done in the European Union Trade Agreement and the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. It's there. It's ready to move on. And this is billions of dollars in opportunities for companies, particularly Western companies. There's a massive benefit to the Western agriculture sector, a part of the country that's hurting right now, and are very supportive of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And we want to be constructive. We'd also like to see them reverse, at this time in particular, reverse their election promise to end income splitting for couples. We're worried that this is not a time to take money out of the pockets of Canadians. So we're going to keep pressing those issues. And we're also going to keep pressing the Prime Minister on his stance on terror. Seven Canadians have died from terrorism in the last week. And Justin Trudeau said to me in the House of Commons that we shouldn't talk about ISIS because it gives them free publicity. He refused to acknowledge that the attack on Parliament Hill was actually a terror-motivated event. Or he said the answer to terrorism is to examine the roots of terrorism. I can tell you what the roots of terrorism are. I can tell you very easily. It's hatred of our values and what we stand for. And it's the desire to see that annihilated, to see our values annihilated, particularly <laughs> someone like me. I always say, I'm a woman, I'm elected, I'm an independent, this, this, this is who they hate the most. And how can we not stand up against these guys? So we will continue to press him. His silence on this issue is deafening. I'm not sure what he's accomplishing. Even a former Liberal cabinet minister said, Sunny Ways is not going to defeat ISIS. But I can tell you I'm encouraged by the fact that our CF-18s are still flying alongside our allies in Iraq, in Syria, despite the Prime Minister's continued assertion that he will pull our CF-18s out of the bombing mission with our coalition. But we believe that our air combat mission should continue. Our Canadian forces have performed, as they always do, with the highest level of professionalism and honour. And their mission has been effective in degrading the strongholds of ISIS. President Obama himself said, one of the key pillars to degrade ISIS is airstrikes. So we will keep pressing the Prime Minister on this issue. We're also going to press him on the issue of a referendum if he decides he wants to change our electoral system. Now, when you talk about changing the most fundamental... <laughs> when you talk about changing the most fundamental way that we govern ourselves, which is basically what he wants to do is change what our vote means, not how we cast it, but what it means and how we govern ourselves. We haven't done that since Confederation. It's not up to the House of Commons or any particular political party or government. It's something that everyone should have a say in. When the rules of the game change, everyone should have a say. So we'll be fighting to make sure that on whatever proposed changes come forward, that they go to the people. Now, simply opposing the government is not enough. We Conservatives must offer Canadians our vision that appeals to our better instincts, to our courage and our kindness, to our pride and our aspirations, and to our sturdy individualism and our unflagging sense of community. The deeply held values common to us all that built and continue to build this great country. It became apparent, I think, to a lot of people on October 19th that too many Canadians see conservatism as harsh or joyless or austere, but in truth, it's optimistic, it's generous, and it's very idealistic. It's rooted in compassion and community and faith in our fellow Canadians, and we're called upon now to remind Canadians of this truth, and we're in a great place to do it. The Conservative movement remains a very powerful force in Canada. Our party is strong, our members are committed, our team in Parliament is extremely talented, energetic and devoted to Canada and to Canadians. The grassroots of conservatism are strong and firmly planted in the Canadian soil. Now I mentioned at the beginning it's exciting times in politics, but that's not just because Justin Trudeau's on TMZ. <laughs> it's also exciting because we're going to have a leadership race in our party and I'm very excited about that. We're going to have more to say about this in the coming weeks. John Walsh, our president, is here. Depends on how many drinks you buy him over lunch. He'll tell you what's happening. But it's a very exciting time. We're going to have, we have a lot of people that have come forward. And I'm really excited about it. Especially the number of women 
who are interested in running our party. It's a fantastic opportunity to showcase the talent that we have and the values that we stand for. So as we look to Parliament resuming next week, I'd like to leave you with a couple final thoughts. As I said, almost 6 million Canadians cast ballots for us in the last election. Our Conservative values resonate with so many Canadians, including those who voted for other parties this time in October, because they fundamentally are Canadian values. They're universal values. In fact, they're shared by Canadians whose families have been in this country for generations, and those whose families can measure their time in Canada in just days and weeks. It's easy for a party in opposition to speak about what it's against, but it's really much more important for us at this time that we speak with clarity about what we stand for. And we stand for freedom and dignity of the individual and the right of every Canadian to pursue his or her dreams. And we believe the only requirement for success should be an appetite for hard work and belief in yourself. We believe strongly that Canadians want to make their own choices about how they raise their kids, how they go about their business, how they live in the present, and how they plan for the future, and not to have those decisions imposed upon them by government. We believe that government should help anyone who's in genuine need and hinder none who find success. The government should pave a pathway to prosperity and then get out of the way. We believe the concerns of law-abiding citizens should be at the heart of our legal system and safe communities are the building blocks of a strong country. We believe that free enterprise and entrepreneurship is the key to safeguarding our environment. And we believe that robust national security is fundamental to preserving our liberties. We believe that doing what's right is more important than doing what's popular. And that this, in particular, is essential to being a principled player on the world stage. And I believe that most Canadians believe these things too. So we're in good shape. Canadians aspire to great things and we share their aspirations. So for the next four years, we will stand up for Canadians, for their hard-earned dollars, for their deeply held values, and for their economic and their personal liberties. We will hold this government to account, but we will do so in a spirit of hope and optimism, and in doing so, convince Canadians once again renew their faith, earn their trust that our Conservative course is the right course for Canada. Thanks so much for being here today and hearing me speak. And I think, Danny, we're going to take some questions. Like question period. <laughs> like question period. You've had a lot of practice at that. So thank you for bringing it to our sure. podium. Shall we, we take a seat sure. over here? So people can hear us. Is that now, before we get started, does this work? I have, a, I have a request before a question, okay. which is I want you, when you go home to Edmonton, <laughs> to tell people you saw it snow in Toronto and we did not need to call the Army. <laughs> <laughs> well, do. <laughs> okay. I'll never forget. I was actually in Edmonton when that happened and had to be harassed for two weeks. It was embarrassing for you. It was. It still is. Not that you can tell. I haven't forgotten. So I wanted to take this opportunity, firstly, to tell everyone in our audience to uh, take advantage of these question cards, which they gave me here to show as a prop. And if you have any questions, to please write them down. Let our wonderful staff here know, and they'll bring them up to me. But to get things started, I had a few questions, Rana, that I wanted sure. to, to ask you and kind of and pick up on some of the themes in your speech and maybe get, give you an opportunity to talk in a little more detail. So the first thing, uh, for me anyway, coming out of the last election and watching the results and the, and the, and the significant majority that uh, the Liberals had is whether there's this resurgence of big tent politics as opposed to kind of working from the base and then trying to... Uh, to win from there. I mean, what is your perspective on that kind of overall philosophy as you shape this next uh, uh, generation of the Conservative Party and the leadership race? Well, I don't think big time politics have gone anywhere. I think they're still here and our party is very much a big tent party. When you think about it, uh, our, our very core support, and I would say everyone in the Conservative Party is a strong fiscal conservative, but we also have you know, a different range of people from social conservatives to libertarians that are all welcome and feel comfortable in the conservative party. So we are a big tent party. I think after the last election results, 
We started with 32% at the beginning of the election. We ended at 32%. The Liberals got 39%. Right. So, yes, we have a great deal of support. And as I said, almost 6 million Canadians cast a ballot for the Conservative Party. So this is a very strong movement. But we have to, we have to grow. Right. And we have to win back some of the people that maybe decided to vote for a different party last time. So when you talked about the values of the Conservative Party, and as an Albertan, those resonated with me. Those are the messages I heard as a, as a kid and young adult growing up there. And do you see it more as emphasis in terms of tone, in terms of approach, as opposed to the fundamental substance of what you were trying to communicate to Canadians in the last election? I think we did hear that, and we've, mm -hmm. we've responded, and I think sometimes it's just a matter of, of a change. Right. Uh, sometimes it can be a change in leadership, it could be a change in tone, but really, I'm very proud of the policies of the Conservative Party and the Conservative movement. And when I speak to Canadians, I haven't heard anyone say, you know, I didn't like the way you handled the economy, you know, I didn't like those tax cuts, and right. you know, there's people really appreciated. Those were popular. They were very popular. <laughs> Our policies were very popular with Canadians. So I think we have a very strong foundation right. to build on, uh, and now we're embarking on, on a leadership race. It's very exciting for us. So in terms of that leadership race, and in case you don't have an opportunity to buy John a lot of drinks over <laughs> lunch, which is interesting, we used to give away wine at these things, good thing we didn't do that today, uh, is what are some of the updates that you can give us in terms of that leadership race and some of the, I know a lot of people have come forward, but in terms of the process, the timing, or how Canadians can get more and more engaged in that process as you go across the country and formalize that? Well, what I would say to Canadians is if they believe in individual liberty and smaller government, less government interference, lower taxes, balanced budgets, you know, personal freedom, this is the party for you. Because we're looking at, at a party opposite us that is about larger governments, higher taxes, more government interference in the economy and in your private lives. So I think we have a fantastic message. The leadership race is an opportunity to pe for people to get engaged. We have, I think, last count, potentially 10 people that are interested. That's fantastic. It's going to be a very competitive race. And if there's anyone in the crowd that's interested... <laughs> you can also put that in your card <laughs> yes. if you want. We'll you can also up. put that in the card and pass it to me. Um, I've been reaching out to people, asking people if they're interested, because this is a fantastic opportunity. We have a very strong party, very strong. And whoever is the leader going into the next election is going to have a very good opportunity uh, to be a very strong force in Canada, a strong force for the conservative movement and to shape Canadian politics. So it's a great opportunity. We have a lot of fantastic people coming forward. I'm really excited about that. We have a leadership election organizing committee. We just met the last couple of days, or they met, I met with them. Um, and they are the ones that decide what all of the rules of the game are. So those will come out in the, the next number of weeks. And then we're off to the races. So, and, and to touch on that, uh, the leadership race and the role of the party and in government. I mean, we do see, you know, in other places, uh, this rise of this anti-establishment kind of personality or theme, people from the outside. And uh, it has obviously its, its benefits in some sense, but it also reflects a frustration in some, in some of the electorate. Uh, how do you see those forces in this country? And how do you see this leadership of trying to preempt them if, if they're coming to the surface, this, this lack of trust in, uh, in traditional institutions and parties? Well, I think we're really lucky in our party because we've always been very close to our grassroots and very close to our people and we've listened to them. So I don't sense at all that our grassroots, you know, that there's gonna be a revolt or an upheaval. When you look at what's happening in the United States um, with Donald Trump and people like that, I mean, it's, I think it's a reflection of their, their political system. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the US, you're either a well-known insider or you have billions of dollars. Otherwise, you can't even run. Now look at our party. The most you can raise from any one person is $1,500. So big money doesn't have that same level of influence. So you have anyone, anyone could decide that they want to run to be the leader of a party, of a national party. And they can put their name in and, and do their best. I mean, that I think is, you know, that's my, my political party. That's a much different kind of political system that we have here in Canada. I think we should be very proud of it. 
And I think the level of frustration in the U.S. is because people are so disconnected from their leaders. I don't sense that with our political parties here in Canada, and definitely not with our party. Well, well that's, that's great news, and, uh, and it's good that you continue to take leadership and want to emphasize those messages as you move forward. And one other follow-up question to that, and you touched, up, uh, touched that in your remarks that actually f helps uh, uh, continue and strengthen that bond of trust is your vote counting. So in terms of, I know you were saying you thought if there should be uh, any changes that significant, they should go forward uh, to the people and ask them and have a referendum on that. But be beyond that, do you think, the, how broken do you think the system is? Uh, is there anything specific that you think um, you should focus on or do you think it largely works? I don't think this was a burning issue during the campaign. Uh, but it was an electoral promise, an election promise that the Liberals made to redo our electoral system. Uh, but as I said, you know, I've said repeatedly, if there was a referendum and, and people chose a different system, every political party would adjust. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. But that's not the argument here. The argument is that the Liberals want to change the electoral system in a way that's very fundamental. It's about how we govern ourselves, what our vote means, and that shouldn't be any particular party. In fact, it definitely shouldn't be a party that holds the majority in a House of Commons. It's just not right. It has to be something. It's something that has to go to the people. And, and people say, well, you know, you guys have never done this. And I was saying to Caroline, well, in fact, Charlottetown, right. the last referendum was a conservative government. And we took that, you know, that went to the people. But this is an issue that has to go to the people. So we have strong precedent for that, there's no doubt. Um, I have a couple questions from the audience in our, in our remaining minutes. And this is an interesting question, builds a little bit about what we've been talking about, but a little more specific, which is, uh, the question is, how do you build your base among younger, urban voters who so heavily supported uh, uh, your, your competing parties in the last election? In places, I guess, like Toronto, they're thinking. I think it's really all about, about getting out there and meeting people, inviting pe people to be a part of it. There's lots of young people in this room here today. It's about making sure that they hear our message, that they feel welcome in the party. We have a lot of very young, active people in our party, which is why we've always had a lot of very young members of parliament. Right. You know, you mentioned when you introduced me, I was the youngest woman ever to be appointed to cabinet, but we have a number of young members of parliament. So I think it's really about outreach. It's about making sure that we invite people into the party to be a part of the process. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have to be hip. All right, of yes. course. Yeah, well, you're yeah. pretty, you're yes. pretty hip. You're pretty that's, hip, and from Ed, being from Edmonton that's Council, that's very I think, important between you and I, especially. <laughs> but uh, the the um, uh, the the, uh, the future in these new, I guess, whatever the word is, the millennials and and the way they look at the world, has that changed a great deal from when we were kids? Do you think there's How something you? else you need to do? How old am I? I'm 25 years old. Yeah. And I'm still hoping to make the Oilers. No. Yeah. Mid-40ish kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> we always have to listen to, to, to people. We have a lot of young people in our party. We have a, a convention coming up in May. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about the Conservative Party that's different than other parties is that we don't have what they call a youth wing. Youth have the same vote as anyone else. So you can be a member at the age of 14, I think it is, and your vote counts as much as mine does. It counts as much as the leader of the party does, anyone in the party. So we find that, that those youth who get engaged feel very empowered. And so they're bringing forward policies that could shape the party, and they have the same authority and empowerment that anyone else in the party does. So it's a great opportunity for uh, young people to get engaged, whereas other parties, there's, they have youth wings, but they don't actually have the same power to exert influence in the party. So it's a great opportunity for young people. And I don't know, millennials, yeah. <laughs> what can I say? But they have a lot of, there's a lot of challenges for millennials in terms of you know, job creation and their future in the country. And these all, it all gets back to the economy. It all gets back to the economy. I'd like to actually pick up on that. Well, firstly, it sounds like the Conservative Party is a lot more dem democratic than my house. So my kids might want to join. They get more influence there than they do, uh, they do with us at the kitchen table. Uh, but in terms of the economy, what are some of the key priorities you see in getting uh, those youth to work and, and have that, that dream, the, the Canadian dream, and that the future will be better than it was uh, for us? Well, we have to worry about the amount of debt that we leave the next generation. 
And we can't have a strong economy without strong fundamentals. And that's why we're concerned about the amount of debt and deficit that this Liberal government is willing to take on. Because structural deficits lead to higher taxes. Higher taxes mean less money in your pocket. It means less opportunity to put your kids in university, to buy that first home. All of those things that allow you to support your kids for their future and for you know, their prosperity in years to come. So there's, there's a great deal at stake here. You know, someone said to me the other day, they're really concerned about what could happen to the economy just over the next four years. Uh, so we're, we're in difficult times. There's no doubt about that. We see someone today on, I think it was BNN said, you know, as I was walking by, I was hearing, you know, the Canadian dollar is in a tailspin. You know, and people's money doesn't go as far anymore. Groceries are more expensive. So we do have to press this government to not raise taxes, to not take on too much debt, and to not leave that debt for further generations. There's a lot at stake for us, but a lot at stake for the next generation. There's no doubt. Um, in terms of, of, uh, of, uh, of a final couple of questions, number one is uh, putting out there, this is a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a provocative question to some extent, but I think it's something you're well prepared to answer, which is, again, a little more specific into what you're saying. But we have someone in the audience that said, I think you lost a lot of red Tories, what's described as led Tor red Tories in the last election. And, and what is your thought on trying to bridge this perceived? I know you don't see it clearly, but there's a perceived divide within the party. Um, do you think it's something, it's something that needs specific attention, or is it something now with, with new leadership and time is, uh, is going to work itself to those core values you, uh, you outlined earlier? I think that you know, the Conservative Party is a very big tent party, and we have within that party, we have red Tories, we have reform reformers, uh, we have what people call blue Tories, as I said, we have libertarians. It is a very big tent party, and it'll continue to be. You know, if there were people that did not vote for us in the last election, um, we hope to earn back their trust, and we'll work hard to do that. And we do remain that party of fiscal conservatism and personal and individual liberty and low taxes, all of the things that the conservative movement has stood for for decades. And so we will reach out as much as we can, and we hope that this leadership race will be an opportunity for potential leadership candidates to actually talk about their vision of the party and debate some of these interesting ideas. Well, there's no doubt. I think we've come to the end of our time. We've taken a great deal of your time. Thank you for making yourself available for these questions. And there's no doubt that everyone feels the same, that with your, your leadership, your vision, your principles, your sincerity, that uh, the best years uh, are ahead for this party. Uh, on that note, I would like to ask Fred Mifflin to come up and uh, say a word of thanks on behalf of the club. Thanks, Danny. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Fred Mifflin, and I am the president-elect of the Canadian Club. Ms. Ambrose, I want to thank you for sharing your party's plans for the future as a strong official opposition. Your candor in outlining the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for the Conservative Party is refreshing. You've taken the helm at a time of tremendous change for Canadians and for the party itself. You've made it quite clear that you and your colleagues are up to the challenge. Throughout your political career, you've demonstrated the capacity to introduce and implement policies and legislation that have made positive changes and a lasting impact. Now as your party finalizes plans for the leadership race, we're anxious to see what the outcome will bring. Please accept our best wishes for continued success as you lead the growth and development of the Conservative Party of Canada. And thanks very much for being here today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes, you can leave. You can even have some lunch if you like. That's it. Wonderful. So thank you. Just to close, I would actually like to thank again uh, the Honourable Rana Ambrose for outlining her vision. As uh, we do look forward to the next uh, several years of, uh, of uh, the challenges to face this country again, as an interest of citizens and being here today is a reflection of that, we are all happy that your party and your leadership is going to play into making these, uh, these years as good as they can be and your ideas forming a large component of our path forward. 
And I would also uh, like to thank our TD, our sponsor, for their generous support in helping making this day possible. Thank you again. And before we close, I would like to take an opportunity to draw to your attention to an event survey card on your table. We greatly value your uh, feedback so we can continue to improve our events uh, for your benefit. And this does conclude today's program. Again, please visit us at our website, canadianclub.org, and please check it for our upcoming events. This meeting is now adjourned. Have a great afternoon and all the best. Thank you.